I want to thank all the groups that brought this together. I understand there's quite a coalition going on down here. It's sort of like Saturday morning in Palo Alto. <laughs> I think the last time I was in this room was in 1974 when I came out to Stanford and I played a chess tournament here at the Lucy Stern Center. Um, which, yeah, I, I, and uh, let's say that uh, I don't, I live in San Francisco, so this is the, a, a journey to Silicon Valley. And uh, my daughter said, are you going to make a TED Talk? <laughs> so for me, it's all TED Talks. Um, anyway, so... Um, I've been asked to give a short history of the idea of corporate personhood. Um, and uh, before I get started, I, I guess I don't have to remind this, this group of about the relevance of all of it. Um, corporate personhood or uh, corporate rights may sound like a really abstract thing. Uh, and if you're trying to discuss it with other people, it's often hard to get the whole discussion back, back, to, you know, back to actual uh, ground. But what we're really talking about is corporate power, and we're talking about a handful of large corporations and the small number of people who run those corporations being able to wield what amounts to a veto in the political process. So, for example, studies released in 2009 showed that uh, about two-thirds of the public supported the idea of single-payer health care. But in the actual legislative process, that idea was considered beyond the pale because it was realized that corporations in, in the healthcare business had the ability to veto anything like that. So it didn't even get into the discussion in any, in any real way. Um, and that same corporate power is, can be seen across industries, giving oil and coal companies veto power over climate legislation, military contractors, tremendous power to block serious cutbacks, uh, banks veto power over financial reforms, and so on in industry after industry. Most crucially, because it goes to the source of their other powers, corporations and trade organizations such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce have shown the power to block uh, even simple transparency measures for disclosure of political spending, as Congresswoman Eshoo is, is, is well aware, much less any more serious regulation. So how did this situation come about? Um, now, I'm sure this audience, everyone's aware that uh, we're talking about court rulings uh, that happened giving corporations equal protection due process under the 14th Amendment back in the Gilded Age. Um, sort of vague language, equal protection, due process, but very powerful when interpreted by sympathetic courts. Uh, and it wasn't just the Santa Clara case, there was a cluster of cases, Munn, uh, San Mateo, the Beckworth case. I'm not going to really get into detail on those particular rulings, uh, but I do want to talk about the context in which they came about, uh, because they didn't just come out of nowhere. Basically, uh, what, what happened in the courts in the Gilded Age can't be understood unless, uh, unless we really look back uh, earlier. And um, one of the most striking things, if you read what people were saying, well before the Santa Clara case was uh, this extremely, uh, uh, say, a, just a climate of skepticism and even uh, hatred of the corporate form in, in America. Uh, and it was generally felt that corporations were really the equivalent, equivalent of, of the social structures in Europe that everybody was trying to get away from. So, for example, in 1835, Alex de Tocqueville wrote, the friends of democracy should keep their eyes anxiously fixed on an industrial aristocracy. For if ever again permanent inequality of conditions and aristocracy make their way into the world, it will have been by that door that they entered. So that was 50 years before Santa Clara. Um, 20 years before that, Jefferson said pretty much the same thing, almost the same choice of words. He said, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations, which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength and bid defiance to the laws of our country. You can see this anti-corporate spirit uh, even before the American Revolution. And in fact, a credible case can be made that the revolution itself was something of an anti-corporate uprising. 
that was triggered by measures passed by Parliament in 1772 designed to rescue the East India Company from a fiscal pri crisis. So that story goes back a couple years before that. There was a famine in, in India uh, that cut into the company's revenues in India. Uh, at the same time, there was a depression in Europe, and the East India Company was looking for new revenues. Uh, they got Parliament to give them a waiver on taxes for sales into the colonies, and they also got Parliament to give them what amounted to a sort of a Starbucks franchise, a monopoly over sales of tea in the colonies. So from that point on, officially only certified merchants would be allowed to sell tea, certified through the East India Company. Uh, now, it's interesting to read that history because uh, you know, we, we hear the Tea Party talk about taxation without representation. The taxation without representation uh, slogan was flying around the colonies after 1765 in the Stamp Act, but it wasn't really getting traction, and it didn't get traction until Sam Adams and other of the radicals were able to bring the business community into the fold, uh, and their motivation was that they were afraid that if the East India Company was able to do this with tea, they could do that with all the rest of the commodities, and the, the future economic uh, course of the colonies would become just a raw material supplier, and that the actual development of business in the colonies was really threatened by it. Um, so this, this business of equating the Tea Party with the right-wing right values of the Republican Party is, is bizarre in, if you actually read the history. Well, after the revolution, the topic of corporate of what to do with corporations was a topic at the Constitutional Convention. And it's interesting because uh, Benjamin Franklin was a big advocate of corporations f because he was a big advocate of, of big infrastructure projects that would uh, catalyze the economy. So he proposed that there be an article in the Constitution that allowed the federal chartering of, of corporations to do things like build canals. Um, but most of the delegates didn't want that, and they felt that this would just be the seed that grew into another East India Company in the United States. So they had, they had very clear ideas about corporate power at that time, and uh, the delegates had already come with instructions on, on what to do with any kind of corporate empowerment in the Constitution. So that idea was raised twice at the Constitutional Convention, and both times it was rejected. And as a result, there's no mention of corporations in the Constitution because the idea was to leave all corporate regulation up to the states uh, through the incorporation process. Uh, they wanted to keep it as close to the grassroots as possible. And they did that for many decades. They had very restrictive uh, treatment of corporations. Uh, for example, uh, chartering terms would only be for 20 or 30 years. Uh, corporations were prohibited from owning property not directly related to their specific line of business. Every corporation had to declare a public, pr a public purpose. You weren't allowed to just have a corporation to make money. Uh, you weren't allowed to own co stock in another corporation. Corporations were kept in this sort of tight fence. Um, and the whole idea was that they didn't want corporations to get out of the bag and become overwhelmingly powerful. So. This was the cultural and the political con and the legal context going into the 1840s and 50s when the railroads were starting to happen. And railroads were going to be interstate businesses, really the first big interstate businesses. And if you look at it from the perspective of the railroad entrepreneurs, uh, they had a problem on their hands. And a lot of the things they did, if you look at it from their perspective, were, were pretty reasonable. Um, so consequently, you had people like uh, Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad really going state by state, reinventing the corporate legal structure uh, piece by piece. Uh, they had to get rid of all these sort of particular special incorporation laws and get a general incorporation statute on the books. Uh, they had to get rid of the limits on amounts of invested capital. Uh, they had to get rid of the limits on operating across state lines on one corporation owning another. They needed to uh, operate at a bigger scale. They wanted to build companies of a national scope. 
Uh, and to do that, they also had to push back at these populist movements, or sort of proto-populist movements that were happening then, like the Granger movement, which was uh, trying to pass state legislation, allowing states like Minnesota to regulate railroads. They had a great ally on the Supreme Court uh, named Stephen Field, uh, one of our local California products. He came out of a, uh, a family, uh, you'd have to call them business visionaries, although they weren't all businessmen, some of them were lawyers, but he had one brother who was one of the, uh, the group that was laying the transatlantic cable. Another was a, a, a railroad attorney, and he himself was very closely connected to Leland Stanford, and he was just a, a big believer in this new kind of big national economy characterized by big national scale of corporations. So he wrote almost religious fervor for, for this new kind of economy. He wrote, there is nothing which is lawful to be done to feed and clothe our people, to beautify and adorn their dwellings, to relieve the sick, to help the needy, to enrich and ennoble humanity, which is not to a great extent done through the instrumentalities of corporations. So <laughs> he really wanted to, he, he, he was the John Roberts of his day. He wanted to really empower corporations quite deliberately. He came to the Supreme Court, and if you look at the pattern of cases, there was just a deliberate strategy unfolding, and he built it around the 14th Amendment. He wanted to broaden an amendment which had been written to empower or to protect the freed slaves. He wanted to broaden that to uh, include corporations. Um, give corporate, uh, pro-corporate justices some kind of tool that they could use to overrule state legislatures. Um, so you, You've probably, many of you have probably heard about the quirky circumstances of the Santa Clara decision. Um, in a nutshell, the decision uh, that is regarded as the precedent for corporations being considered quote unquote persons under the 14th Amendment, um, actually when you read the decision which was written by Justice Harlan, there isn't anything about, there's no reasoning for that conclusion. That conclusion was added on, sort of slapped on by the court reporter uh, ex post facto, saying, well, this is what they said on the bench. This was an oral statement by the Chief Justice. In a way, it's not really relevant because in subsequent cases, the, the Supreme Court justices, they were mostly railroad attorneys. They were, they were happy to start using that precedent. And, and, and uh, so in that way, the, 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 the circumstances, these quirky circumstances aren't relevant, but what is uh, unfortunate is that because they never really explained their reasoning, uh, it allowed the, this sort of personhood uh, precedent to be used in all kinds of very broad ways in the future. And no one ever had to go back and, and defend the rationale. So it's kind of like if you have a family secret. Because you can't talk about the dysfunction, you can never really correct it. And um, as it turns out, the rationale was actually stated very clearly by Justice uh, by Justice Field in another case called San Mateo, which was almost identical to Santa Clara. They were folded together, but the rationale was, was laid out at the appeals court level, so it's not part of the precedent. But the, the rationale is this. Uh, it's what scholars call the associative theory of corporate rights. The idea is that if you have a group of people, and each of those people enjoys certain rights, then by extension, those, those rights, particularly property rights, should pool together just the way the property is pooled together so that the, the corporation, which is the joint property, should get the same protections. And it's intuitively obvious to someone like Field because the way he saw corporations operating was these sort of groups of buddies starting these companies together, you know, raising the capital, and it was just this sort of consensus thing where the corporation really was the people. Um, and it's an attitude that even you, you see today, you know, someone like Mitt Romney gets asked about corporations, you know, are corporations persons? He says, of course corporations are persons. Uh, he said, uh, literally, corporations are people, my friend. Of course they are. Everything that corporations earn ultimately goes to people. It's this kind of 1% attitude that it's just us. Um, it's sort of the, uh, it, it's really saying that a corporation is the same thing as a family business or an unincorporated partnership. You know, it's just a group of people. Um, the problem is that the whole point of inventing the corporation was that these traditional business models were inadequate uh, for a lot of things that people wanted. So, for example, um, uh, uh, oh, just to live longer than the life of the, of, the, of the owners, just as one example, and there's many more. The problem is that uh, 
so, so formally, a corporation is a legal entity that's not the same as the owners. It's distinct. Now, the, the problem is you're creating a new kind of property that's different from regular property, like a horse. A horse, if my horse knocks down somebody's door, I have to, I have to answer it in court. But if I own stock in ExxonMobil and I read that ExxonMobil has devastating sub-region of the world, I can just turn the page. It has no effect on me. So, um, so all kinds of advantages accrue to corporations because of this, uh, because of this, uh, uh, you know, being able to legally incorporate. They can morph, they can split, they can do all kinds of things. Um, and um, due to these advantages, um, Due to these advantages, uh, legal theorists have, have been criticizing the idea of corporate personhood for a long time. But rather than undoing it, what we have now in the, in the Citizens United era is extending these ideas from just being uh, about property to being about First Amendment rights. And here's where the logic gets really stretched. Um, this is, the, this is the, the whole new campaign that happened since the 1970s. So it wasn't... It wasn't the Gilded Age that gave these rights that we're now talking about. It happened in the 1970s and more recently uh, with Citizens United. Um, and um, I won't, I won't, I'm going to really quickly summarize uh, you know, what, what Justice Powell was trying to do is really, uh, once again, just like Justice Field had done in the Gilded Age, Gilded Age literally trying to re-empower the corporation, feeling that the government regulation of corporation had gone too far in, you know, with environmental and consumer regulations. So, um, why is this such a radical leap? Um, the reason is that however tenuous it was in the first place to equate personal property with corporate property, at least with corporate property, we have a notion that's comprehensible. With corporate speech, we presume that there's a speaker, but in a corporation, there are three distinct groups that you could call speakers. There's management, there's stockholders, and workers. Those three groups. Well, forget the workers, for starters. Um, <laughs> But even the stockholders, right now, under corporate governance law, stockholders don't even have the right to know what the corporation is spending politically, much less to control it. But then when you think about it, managers themselves don't really have any freedom to spend this money either because they're legally required to simply operate in accordance with corporate maximization. So really what you have is you have corporate spending in the political realm on automatic pilot, and it's the farthest thing from a First Amendment situation of free speech. Well, most Americans aren't, aren't, aren't concerned or don't care about all these legal technicalities. They don't care about this history. But one thing is clear is that according to the Gallup poll, 67% of Americans say that ma major corporations have too much power. Because this is a power issue. And the interesting thing is, this isn't a partisan issue. It goes right across the spectrum. 56% of Republicans, 69% of Democrats, 73% of, uh, sorry, 69% of independents, and 73% of Democrats. Um, people aren't, people aren't, uh, don't understand exactly how this power has come about, but they do know illegitimate power when they see it. And what impresses me about the movement that we're seeing uh, is that, uh, is the connection people make between the power that they viscerally despise and what they're beginning to see as a solution through a constitutional amendment. Um, and it's not, to me, it's not just compelling how many states and municipalities have adopted resolutions. It's also the lopsided nature of the votes. 75% in Montana. Uh, that's a red state if I ever saw one. When I was in Colorado, I, I found people talking about a corporate personhood measure being placed on a referendum, and all kinds of other groups were trying to get their issues on the referendum too, so they could ride on the coattails of the popularity of over overriding corporate rights. So, I'll just conclude by saying I think we've we've actually hit sort of a tipping point here, and the attendance in this room is evidence of that. Um, this is a, a thrilling for me. It's an exciting moment in history. We have activist public servants like Congresswoman Eshoo, and we have public activists like Peter, and all of you who've taken the time to be out here, to, of your busy lives to be here today. So 
for, all I can say is keep on fanning the flames, and thanks again for inviting me here.